Welcome back to another week of Municipal Month on the Cross-Border Interviews. I am so honored and pleased to have our guest onto the show today. He is the mayor, and I just learned this prior to recording this, he has been the mayor of the village of Torque since 2009, and I'm pleased and honored to have him on the show now. Please welcome village mayor of Torque, Torque, sorry, Mike Ostrakan, I apologize. You said it twice and I still messed it up. Mayor, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Chris. I, I've actually been called worse, so um, that's that's not so bad. So, but thanks for having me. So, uh, Your Worship, let's get this party started with the question I've asked every single elected official or candidate to be an elected official. Uh, the same question to start off all my interviews, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Oh, good, good question. So... I guess I'll start with a little bit of my community and, and I'll answer your question along the way. But um, so I, I moved to Torquay when we were about five years old and, and Torquay is a pretty small community. I think we're at 215 people right now. But um, as you grow up in a small community, you learn that um, to get things as a child, you need to help out. Um, you need to volunteer, uh, whether it's slinging hamburgers at, at the local rink or, you know, working the canteen at the school you learn that you need to do that to, to make your community function. And, and I think it stems from that and, and having parents that pushed you into a volunteering to do that sort of thing. So I guess that's sort of where that, that comes from. So, yeah. So you could have given back in many ways through volunteerism, through nonprofits, but you chose the political route in 2009. What was that decision based on? Because as I said, there was many avenues you could have given back, but you chose political. Why did you think your voice and your uh, approach could have best served your community on the political route? Well, well, I think, and I'll be brutally honest with you, I I didn't like the direction the community was going at the time. I I was pretty young at that time, 2009. So uh, I'm I'm 42 now. So that's, that's uh, gives you a sense of how old I was at the time. Um, I think as a younger person, you want to see your community grow and foster. And, and there was just some things that I didn't see that was happening in my community. And, and, and I wanted to change that. And, and I'm hoping uh, as my time, whenever that comes to be done as mayor uh, ends, that people will see that in that time, there was some good changes happen. So now you've served in council uh, as mayor for almost 14 years now, well, 13 years, almost 14 years coming into 2023 yep. year. Um, I want to go back to that very first election in 2009, and I want to ask the question that I've asked a lot of the municipal councillors, and it gets me to understand who you are as an elected official. That very first moment walking into that council room as the mayor-elect, as the mayor-designate, how much weight and responsibility did you put on your shoulders Because the decisions that you make around that council table will not only affect the day-to-day lives of your families, your friends, but your community members. So how much of a weight and responsibility was it for you to serve in that role in 2009? And do you still feel that weight today? Absolutely. So um, going back to that day, I think it was one of those things where you walk walk into that room thinking you can change the world. And, (laughs) And... Ultimately, at the end of the day, you find out very quickly that there's other people that help make those decisions and you're not the one to make those decisions. Um, uh, as, as a younger person, I, I was in a, in a small community. You pretty well know everybody in this community, 215 people. I, I can probably tell you everybody's name and where they live in this community. Um, and and as, as you go forward as their mayor being elected, and the election came down to, I think, I think at that time, I think it was 60 votes. So really small vote count for a small community, right? Makes sense. But at the end of the day, you knew those those people that voted for you. You knew what, what they kind of envisioned for their community and, and you had a vision for yourself and um, finding out very quickly that you needed to work together with other people. It's not the whole American style system where it's you demand this and it gets done. You have to work with people and make those connections. So um I think that was one of the, the biggest things I learned right off the start. And, and, and hopefully people that run for municipal council understand that before they get involved. You talked about the, 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 the pace and also you wanted to change the world when you were first elected in 2009. Yeah. Um, municipal politics is not something that happens overnight. It's not like you see on TV shows or federally or even provincially. 
decisions you make could take six months, a year, three years, five years, or big infrastructure projects could take 10 years to complete. Was that the biggest learning curve that you had as the as a first term mayor back in that first election? Or was there something else that you went, whoa, I didn't expect municipal politics to be this way? Yeah, good question. So my answer is going to be a lot different than the other other um, mayors and, and councillors you probably we talked to before, but um, one of the things I thought as uh, a municipal leader is we had staff for everything. <laughs> and I can tell you, you, you do not know about your community until you've sat in the, a boat in the middle of lagoon or at the bottom of your lift station, helping shovel whatever's in the bottom of a lift station out. Um, you don't know what's, what your community is all about. And, and, and finding that out is, is something that I don't think most politicians have done or will ever do, but um, it, it, it's kind of one of the most rewarding things because you really get to know what what the infrastructure needs of your community are and 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 where those priorities should be fairly quickly so um yeah did did you learn about the the process of saying no because you, your issues that you believe that you need to change the, the village that you live in are going to be different from your neighbors, from your community. And you are, people are going to come to you on a regular basis and say, you need to fix this pothole. You need to fix this issue. You need to fix that issue. And at the end of the day, you have to look at the village and the community as one and not pick and choose, but you have to look for the betterment of the community. How challenging was that? Because especially in a smaller community where you literally know everyone, <laughs> I can imagine yeah. John down the street and uh, Betty down the street are gonna be at the grocery store, or the convenience store, ripping one off in your ear if you don't fix their issue right away. Or is it not like that in the city, in the village? Well. It, it definitely was at the start. I, I really had to set some boundaries with with residents. Um, I I wanted council to be involved, and um, it went from me getting all the phone calls to me saying, "Have you talked to your councillor about certain issues? Have you talked to your councillor about this?" Um, and that's that's really changed the outlook of the village. They, they they've started to um, start asking um, councillors their opinion, and I don't think that was the case before I got on council. And I, I don't want to disparage past councils, but um, I, I think a lot of times the mayor was phoned at the time of the day, and then things got done. Um, but I really wanted the input of council um, on how we move forward on things, and they needed to know what was going on or what the issues were, because at the end of the day, I I wasn't the only person on council, so. Um, I think that was the biggest thing for me and, and, and probably one of the better changes that happened within the first year was council was getting more involved and hearing those concerns from residents. How much of a key role does communication play in the village of your size? Because I can imagine while you know everyone, you can have a conversation with everyone, you still need to communicate through government official channels. So how much of a key role does communication play for you, but also the village? Huge, huge role. Um, at, at the end of the day, it, it, it's um, people need to know what's going on. And, and you don't really know your neighbors till their water's been shut off and you get that nasty phone call for, <laughs> for a long time, right? So um, one of the things we, we've instituted and it's very simple, we've gone with a WhatsApp group and and, and I think mostly everybody in, in town is, is on that WhatsApp group so we can communicate really quickly if there's a water main break and with our old infrastructure, we usually have to shut the whole community off. So um, going on precautionary boil water advisories has been fun. Um, People sometimes don't understand what that means, but um, at the end of the day, everybody has a right to know what's going on in, in their communities. And, and, and that's probably one of the easiest ways as a community that we, we've been able to communicate to our residents. So, I, I'm sorry, you've lost me after the fact that you have a WhatsApp group that communicates <laughs> to all your residents. I'm yep. sorry, as a communications person from a town in Northern Alberta, can we take you and just bring you to that town and say, everyone, let's get on WhatsApp so we can communicate correctly? That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it, it, and, and you know, it's, it's worked really well and, and, and we've really seen some uh, improvement and um, it's not just about water main breaks or road closures. We've actually used it to advertise uh, like this Friday, our Lutheran church is having a steak fry. We put that on there. It's an alert and info information for the residents of the community. It's just another way, another tool for us to communicate to them. How much 
because you're in a rural community and uh, technology is a big part of that, especially over the last few years that we saw, how much has your community changed over the last three years with the COVID pandemic and with everything that we saw? Or, and I think rural communities were a little bit more easier to handle than say larger cities like Calgary or Edmonton or Saskatoon and Regina. So for you, how was it through the last three years of the COVID-19 pandemic as the mayor of your village? Well, to be honest, I, I guess this might be a little different than some other communities, but um, not a lot of things changed in our community. We're, we're farming oil and gas and, and mining is, is right around us. And I, I think the biggest issue for us was, was how, how the churches dealt with things. Um, we, we do have two churches in our community and, and how that all, all worked for, for them to practice and worship. Um, was was a big issue uh, our community center and, and how the rink function that's that's one of our big recreational things so um just dealing with that i think was was the big issue and, and once we got it figured out um i, I think things work really well and, and people understood why we had to do it but other than that we we weren't we didn't have the issues the transit issues and, and all those things that everyone else had uh, we're, we're pretty pretty small um we we actually had, uh, at COVID time, we we were looking at how to get groceries into our community. We don't have a grocery store in Calgary, so um, you have a convenience store said, though. We don't even have a convenience store, so so one of our issues was how do we get groceries to our to our residents that maybe can't travel and. Um, Esteban being our closest big center, we we were looking at partnering with the co-op in Esteban just just to get groceries hauled into Torquay if if we needed that. We luckily we never had to do that, but it, it was one of those things that that's probably our biggest issue is trying to get people the things that they needed on a daily basis. Well, hello. This is your friendly host of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I have some big news for you. I am pleased to announce that our show has partnered with Strategic Steps Incorporated to launch a brand new show on October 19th. The Political Trenches, Local Government at Work is a new show with a focus on local governments. Each episode, we will discuss the biggest stories from local governments and we will have a roundtable discussion on issues facing local governments today. Follow the news show by searching The Political Trenches on all social media platforms. We are looking forward to discussing local governments and heading into The Political Trenches. Well, it, you just opened up the perfect segue into our second segment, and that is your community. And before I ask the, the, the question to start it off, I want to preface this by saying, because we've had complaints already through online social media, because you know everything on social media is true, everyone. <laughs> um, this is a conversation between the mayor and myself. This is his opinion. Yeah. This is not a direction of council. This is not an, a motion at council. This is an opinion from the uh, mayor and myself talking. So to, the, to ask the question then is, what is the biggest issue facing your village today? <laughs> Good question. So where do I, where do I start? I, I think let's start at the beginning, I mean, sir. <laughs> <laughs> a very fine place to start to yeah. sound of music. So uh, I'm going to, I'm going to start uh, one thing and then maybe I'll go to something else that, that might be a little controversial in the whole scheme of the province of Saskatchewan. But I, I would say for my community, it, um, and, and, and a whole look at Saskatchewan um, admin, administrators, uh, chief administrating officers for our community is one of the biggest issues um, facing small communities like myself. Um, Saskatchewan has over 700 municipalities and, and finding people to run the day-to-day -day operations of a municipality is, is really, really tough. We're going through that right now. So um, I would say that that is one of our biggest issues right now. And So why do you think that I, is? Why do you think that is well, that, that smaller rural communities like yours are having issues like that? Because you're not the first person I've heard yeah. that from. Well, and the, and the thing I see is, is um, at some point, uh, administrators, um, that job needs to be told and the story needs to be told to, to um, kids that are going through school, university, that it's a viable option for a job. You can stay in your home community. You can make really great dollars and help out your community and stay in your home community. And, and I think at the end of the day, it, it, it's not being told well enough. Now, here's the controversial part of that. And, and al amalgamation is a bad word in Saskatchewan. Don't get me wrong. I'm not it's for a bad word everywhere, I think. <laughs> but don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not 
I'm not promoting amalgamation, but I think at the end of the day, communities in Saskatchewan need to find ways to work better together. Um, is should there be 15 graders in 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 five different communities within a two mile radius? Probably not. Um, you know, finding ways to save tax dollars, even on administration costs. Our our administrator works four and a half days. Probably could be three days, but because he's training, we're at four and a half days. Um, our community is small, so to just make sense that three days is, is administrative days. But I think at the end of the day, partnering with our neighboring municipalities to to find those efficiencies is the way forward. And I know people all have their own fiefdoms, and this is the way we've done it for a hundred years. And, and and how do we deal with that? But um, at a certain point, um, taxpayers don't want to pay any more money. And where do you find those efficiencies? Um, as communities and community leaders, I know it's tough to talk about, but we really need to find those ways to work together and, and drop some of those barriers and say, look, we can make this a better place if we work together. So how do you do that? How do you do that as the mayor? Because um, it's a hard discussion to start. I, I know, that yeah. I, again, I we used to work in a municipality and that was like, a, that you do not mention the amalgamation yeah. word at all, because if you did, it would break M MOUs, it would break uh, agreements yep. between rural municipalities and the towns. And you need to have one person step up and say, okay, enough's enough. Just because we did it a, a hundred years this way, it doesn't mean that we continue doing it this way. So how do you see yourself playing a role in having that hard discussion that you kind of desperately need? Well, exactly. And, and I think um, it depends on the, the flavor of council. And, and, and I have to give credit to our surrounding rural municipality, RM Cambria number six. Um, we have a really good way, working relationship with them. We partner on a lot of things at our fire department, um, our community center, rec center, um, you know, things like that. We have a great relationship. Um, but I think it comes down to talking to them. Um, as, as a council, we have a liaison committee where we sit down and talk with their council and our council and talk about things that are happening in our community. At the end of the day, they don't want to be responsible for our community and, and we don't want to be um, the RM, but partnering on, on things is, is, is important. And if, if councils change, I, I think sometimes those heads butt and um, throughout Saskatchewan, we, we've been seeing that where they've been sharing joint offices and then council change and then they fall apart and everybody goes their separate way again. There needs to be a way that um, it, this is for the betterment of all residents in, in this province and, and the municipalities that, that are affected. So um, obviously the, it's, it's about. Does the province have a role to play in this as well then? They do. They, they, they ultimately they do, but um, in this day and age is of politics let's say um you need to have those wedge issues sometimes and and this may be one of those wedge issues that they don't want to touch or, or um you need to have some political will and um the right people to to buy in and 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 as as you know um like first nations they're they're really taking off and start to take a leadership role in that and 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 we all need to be better we all need to start working together and and looking at how we do things better because at the at the end of the day municipalities were built for basically in my opinion the great depression to, to deal with the great depression and how things were back then and and things are changing very rapidly and i know a lot of people don't like change but at the end of the day something needs to change and i'm not i'm not for amalgamation i don't i don't think that works but i think partnerships work and and i really like to partner with with my neighbor and basically it comes down to being a neighbor um talking to that person over your fence and saying can we build a fence together at the end of the day? So have you had that conversation with the RM already? Because I can imagine, like you said, you do go through changes and with elections being there since 2009, you have probably seen RM Reeves or count, uh, mayors come and go. Um, but at the end of the day, you're still there and the residents of your village don't care about what's happening in their neighbor's yard. They want you to fix it because you're the mayor. So have you been having these conversations? Well, well, ultimately, I guess I'm pretty lucky because I think the, the, the Reeve of the RM has been there just as long as me. So oh. um, <laughs> me, and, me, <laughs> me and Darwin have had um, a really good conversations about, about how things um, work. And, 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 and how, how we need to go together. And that's not to say we don't disagree on a lot of things. 
but at, at the end of the day, the things that really matter, and when it comes down to it, we, we partner and um, our fire department's a partnership, 50-50 share. Um, huge um, for us um, because that's important to residents. You know, our, our community center rink is, is the RM helps fund that as well. And they use it for their um, uh, emergency shelter if there's something were to happen in the RM. So things like that, discussions like that are, are, are important. We, we also, in our community, we don't, we don't own a grader in, in the village of Torquay for our roads. Our roads are gravel. Um, we partner with the RM. The RM will come in and grade our roads for us um, just as an exchange of, of things. So um, it's important to talk to people and, and, and you wouldn't believe the things you can get done when you sit down face to face and talk to somebody about what's happening in your community and the issues you face and the issues they face. At the beginning of the question, I asked you about the issue and you said attracting talent, attack, attracting yep. administration, whether that be the operators, whether that be the CAO, whether that be anyone. How do you do that? Because as a small uh, village, I can imagine you're trying to promote yourself, you're trying to attract people to your community, but when you have Saskatoon, Regina, Yorkton, Estevan, all saying, hey, we can offer you this, and why would I go to a small village? So how have you been able to try to change the mindset of potential uh, staff to come to your community? So a little bit on, on, on my community. So um, our, our past administrator who had just been here for 22 years, just, just retired this year. So um, uh, we were in the process of finding a new administrator. Um, the thing with our waterworks is, is, is our waterworks guy is a contractor. And, and so he contracts it. And then our public works guy is basically a summer guy and our snow removal, we, we contract that out or get the RM to help. So um, finding staff may be a little more difficult for us just because it's contract trying to find those people, but uh, attracting them, I, I think at the end of the day, it's it's finding people that understand small communities. And I know you use rule a lot and in Saskatchewan, there's a big fight about the urban rural name. So urban is a village, you know, a town. Um, so Torquay is considered village or an urban center in, in really? the scheme of the legislation. Yeah. So um, it, trying to attract those people to your community is tough, but ultimately we put out a call for resumes. We had, we had three, three applicants apply exciting, exciting stuff. And, and two of them weren't from our community. Ultimately we settled on one just because of the training aspects. But I, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's about trying to promote yourself and those people that follow me on Twitter, I, I hate when they talk about things in our, our area and say it's always Estevan. And I, I try to correct them as much as possible because I think that that's a tool to help um, attract people to our region, um, whether it's the RM or the village. So um, trying to do as many things on social media as possible. And for some reason in the, in the last year, we've seen a, our community start growing with people from Ontario and BC and we don't know what the, what what has brought them to Torquay, um, but um, it's exciting. It's it's really exciting for our community. So I don't know what's working. I don't know what the magic formula is, but uh, something must be working for us. So while you're talking about growth a little bit, let's play in that sandbox for a bit, if you don't mind. How do you keep up with growth in a small village? Because I can imagine when people are looking for your looking for a place to live. And they're looking, say, in a uh, urban rural setting, which seems weird to say, but here we are. You are an urban center, according to the province of Saskatchewan. Um, how do you promote yourself to say, come live here? Because it's going to be a question I ask later on, but come live here. We have great opportunities for you where you could build your dream house. You could do this and that, but also say at the same time, we want to still keep that small town village feeling. Yeah, well, absolutely. And one of the things that's happening right now is, is we're spending uh, $2 million on a water treatment plant upgrade. Uh, our community has a budget on our on our operating side of $180,000. So without our partnership with the feds in the province, we wouldn't be able to do that. But that's one of the things we're hoping we'll start attracting people. It's going to be reverse osmosis, and, you know, that, that could water, I guess, everybody everybody likes but that's one of the things and, and we've also we've also upgraded our community center through a partnership with our RM and, and the, the federal government and the provincial government um, to upgrade our community center and, and we I think we put close to three hundred thousand dollars into that as well so um, we're trying to do those things those infrastructure things that people want to see want to have and and and, and hopefully 
uh, in the future that'll that'll start getting people looking at us. You are going into budget season if you haven't already started discussions around budget. Um, the last few years have been challenging for a lot of uh, residents, a lot of Canadians from coast to coast to coast, particularly here in Western Canada with the uh, energy industry, with the resource industry go going sideways. How much of a challenge is this year's budget going to be for you to try and keep that maintained level of uh, uh, minimal at best increase, but also still understand that cost of living is going up, cost of infrastructure projects is going up, and you can't milk a stone as more any more than you already have sorry that's i know it's a weird yeah, yeah. phrase but how do you yeah. how do you see yourself looking at this year's budget compared to previous ones that you've done so interesting fact about torquay um with the provincial law in saskatchewan we don't have to approve our our budget till june so we actually just finished up our last year's budget in, in june and went through that but um so our, our cycle is a little different than most but i think at the end of the day it's 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 about finding those ways and, and using your tax tools to the best of your ability. Um, in Torquay right now, we have a base tax. So at the end of the day, we, um, we look at what it costs to ultimately run our municipality and, and, and have a base tax. So the biggest, the most expensive house in our community um, ultimately has the same services as the smallest, cheapest house in, in, the, in the community. So we, we base our, most of our taxes on that. So the base tax is figured out that way. So everybody kind of pays the same for the basic services. And then, then after that, the mill rate factor comes in. And so we don't have to have a huge mill rate factor and have those big swings and taxes. And um, in the last, since I've been on council, I would say the biggest increase was probably 3%. I would think is was what we've ever had. So um, we're There's trying a lot of municipalities things. out there who are jealous of you right now. <laughs> yeah, and and ultimately we're trying to find those ways to keep our taxes low to for people outside of our community to look at us and say, hey, this is a great place to come. We we can build those our dream home here. We can buy a house for under two hundred thousand dollars. That's fourteen hundred square foot. You know. Um, we, we want people to come here. We want people to see uh, our community for what it is. So um, we're trying those our best to keep taxes low and, and, and keep building infrastructure at the same time. I want to talk about the role and responsibility of the municipal level of politics in a small village like yours. Um, your residents, they seem very engaged in the, the democratic process. They seem very open to having conversations. For God's sakes, they're all on WhatsApp. So good on you for doing that. I can imagine there's a lot of municipalities who are also jealous of that part of your community. But you are responsible for the municipal day-to-day -day operations of the, of the, the, the village. But the, the residents... Do they understand that while there are healthcare issues, while there's uh, police issues, while there's X, Y, and Z issues, they may be f uh, provincial issues, they will go to their MLA or will they come to you and ask you to talk about healthcare? We need better healthcare services in this community. We need a uh, RN. We need a doctor, a family doctor in this community because you're the mayor and you were there to represent them on a provincial level. So talk to me about the roles and responsibility from council's perspective on provincial and municipal issues. Yeah, absolutely. We, we hear from residents all the time about healthcare, um, not, not a municipal um issue um the thing with torquay is we don't we don't have a hospital we don't have doctors or nurses living here um we have uh, what's called first responders so they're the people on the ground that get there before the um before the ambulance gets there so um volunteer position um local residents are very important for our community it's, it's helped save many lives but um struggling to find people with that because people are so busy and, and, and we hear that all the time. We need more. We hear that from the first responders all the time. We need, we need more. Um, and that's great. Um, but finding those people because they're so busy, we hear that. Um, the other thing that we hear all the time is, is highways. You know, we hear about the highway to Estevan or waivers is really bad. We have no control over that, but at the end of the day, we can have input with our local MLA uh, into that. And, um, you know, th things like that come up all the time. And, and, and it's just, 
sometimes I wonder if, if people weren't listening during those days of civic classics, civic classes in, in, in school about what the differences are. But uh, at the end of the day, you're, st you're still a counselor for this community. And, and if your residents are really needing health care or roads, um, you can be the vessel to push that farther along. And, and don't, don't take that lightly because the next election that could be what you're voted on on is not pushing the issues of your residents at, at a different level of government. You have been in uh, office since 2009, as we said at the beginning of the episode, you have probably come across your fair share of issues that have come across your desk. Is there one that you started off with in 2009 that you're still trying to move forward today? Is there an issue, whether it be uh, uh, funding, whether it be an infrastructure project that you're still saying, okay, we need to get this done. And no matter how long I'm in this office, I will continue to push for it. Yeah, well, and hopefully it comes to fruition by the end of April, but water treatment, um, and, and, and I said before, we, we were funded for a grant for that. So that's one of the biggest issues we've had in our community. I remember going to high school here before our high school closed, and you could actually drink the water, and I don't know if many people in the community drink the water anymore. As the mayor, I do. Uh, I, I, I filter my water, but um, just just that project alone has, has been one of my my things is, is getting the best water possible for our residents um, would make a huge difference. I, I think that's the biggest issue um, for me and maybe some of my counselors um, because in a small community, you know, we have we have two miles of residential roads. I, roads aren't that big of an issue, but um, you turn somebody's water off in this community for more than four hours it's not a good thing. So um, I, I would say water's the, been the biggest issue for me. So, yeah, I want to, I want to touch on the water issue here for a second, because you mentioned something at the beginning of the episode that I want to play on a little bit. And that is the boil water recommendation. I think you said. Yep. Okay. Precautionary boil water advisory. Precautionary boil water advisory. <laughs> yes. How long has the city a village been under that? So we're not under one right now, but, um, Every time we go to fix uh, a water shutoff valve or um, dig up a, a water main break, um, because our, our infrastructure is so old, we, we basically have to shut the water off to the whole community. And, and once the pressure gets so low in the community, then uh, by regulation, you have to have a precautionary boil water just, just to cover in case there's something in the line, which, which I ultimately get. But um, at the end How of the day, How often are you under a precautionary boil water advisory? How often, like, I'm, uh, not trying, I'm not trying to make a joke here no. it's just, because infrastructure, well, it's, like, it's not, pipe, yeah. like water pipes seem to be one of these things that municipalities should be like worried about on a regular basis. Yeah. And I'm glad that you're getting the water upgrade, but how often have you been under one since your time in office? Would you say? Oh, I, I think since 2009, I would say it's, it's under 10 times. Okay. It's not like, very oh. often. No, 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 no. <laughs> but, um, but since we've been doing this water treatment plan upgrade in the last year, we probably had, I think, three just because our infrastructure is so old and we've had a couple of breaks there as we're changing lines and things. But um, I think I think just just having residents understand what that means. Um, I, I know some people are like, oh, my God, everybody's going to die. It's boil water. There's something in the water. But um, ultimately, it's precautionary. So it, if you're washing vegetables and things like that, maybe, maybe boil the water first, but you can shower in it. You can, you can bathe in it. It's, it's fine. It's not going to hurt you. It's not like some communities where they've had the, you must boil water advisory. And there's been a few of them in Saskatchewan as well. So um, it's just a different way of thinking. It's, it's to cover everybody uh, liability wise that in, in case something happens, that's there and, and, and safety is always paramount with water. So um, we need to be careful with that. I am not shocked, but I'm flabbergasted about that. I just, I can't imagine in 2021, we still have a partial boil water, <laughs> precautionary yeah. boil water advisor, but here we are in 2022, I should say. Uh, I want to turn to our last segment, uh, Your Worship, and that is tourism and people coming to your community. Um, if I was a tourist coming through your community, what should I stop and see? Well, you probably first should bring a, a shotgun. Um, we're, we're one of those places where uh, pheasants are huge. Hunt, things are huge around here. <laughs> um, and, and we're really, we're really, really excited that the, the American border has opened up. We're 10 kilometers from the U.S. border. So um, 
American hunters come up here, they spend, they spend money in our small community. They, you know, um, it's, it's pretty exciting time for us right now with hunting season happening. And, um, the, we're excited about that. So uh, I would say that for right now, that's probably the biggest thing. Um, we have some um, ladies that are real artists and, 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 and their quilting guild that they do. Some of those quilts those ladies make is just absolutely amazing. Um, they have a quilt show every couple of, two times a year or something, something like that, I think. So um, yeah, we have some real artists in this town and um, one of, one of our residents, Lauren Doe, she's a real artist. She paints with coffee, a- amazing, amazing things with, coffee paint it's uh the paintings made or i guess she dips the paint in coffee i don't know how she does it but she makes amazing art portraits um with coffee and uh um she's been recognized in the u.s and and, and around uh, canada so um that's another uh, thing that's pretty interesting for our community so I want to talk about the tourism, the border opening here for a second, because I, I completely forgot that you're that close to the border. For some reason, I thought you were north of Estefan for some reason, but no, you're closer. Um, last two years, you've seen the border close. So those tourism dollars haven't been flowing into your community. And I can imagine for a small community like that, when you even get a little bit of the big chunk of tourism dollars, it must be uh, hard. <clears throat> Pardon. Yep. Sorry look now that it's open now that everything's sort of quote unquote back to normal um are you looking forward to next year because this is the first year and people are slowly getting back to normal but next year is the year that everything is open right we don't have the arrive can app we don't have uh, uh, masking we don't have testing we don't have seven day quarantine so next year is the year that you hopefully attract more people to your community how do you see yourself doing that to say hey stop in torquay on your way to this area or stop in torquay come see our uh, quilting guild come see lauren doe yeah, well, it's exciting because I'm actually really excited to go down to the, the rink this winter and, and see our friends from Crosby, North Dakota that haven't been able to come up and play hockey against their hockey team. So um, just to go have a, a rink burger and, and talk to some of those people. So um, I'm excited for that. And and I think I think at, 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 as the border opens, and I know most of my the people in my community have mailboxes in the U.S., going down to pick up the flyers, what's happening down in the U.S., you know, um, stopping, stopping there is, is great and, and and you know and those people come up here and and check out what we have to offer so um just that cross-border no basically comes down to knowing your neighbor again right it's look over the fence there's our neighbor we need to get visiting with them and and that's exciting for us um uh our residents um spend lots of time in the states the, the our friends in the u.s spend lots of time up here and and, and we're excited to get back to that well, we, we're always promoting cross-border anything on the cross-border interviews with Chris Brown. <laughs> um, second last question, you know, your worship, and that is after a long day, after a long day of going down to the wastewater treatment facility and <laughs> just enjoying yourself down there, as you can imagine, yeah. after a long day at council, what's one thing that you can do in your community that decompresses you? What's the one thing that you can get out and just, is there a park? Is there a community organization? Is there a restaurant? Is there something in your community that you go to and you say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm at peace again? Well, for, for me, being a political junkie, it'd be turning on CPAC. But um, for, for, for a lot of people in my community, um, our, our community is kind of a, kind of a square. Um, so I think when you walk around, it's about two miles. But people get out and walk. Um, we don't have the traffic of the big centers. Um, we, you talk about road counts and, and traffic on roads. I bet you we see maybe a vehicle an hour, if that, uh, on some of our streets. So people can get out and with their kids in the stroller, ride their bikes um, in that circle or in that square, I guess. And, and um, that's one of the major things that people do here. They just get out and enjoy nature. And, and, I, and I think at the end of the day, that everybody wants to be able to do that. So. And my last question for you here, and this is the big one, and you can take as long as you want to think about this before you answer it, or <laughs> you can just answer it, because I'm assuming after being mayor since 2009, you have this answer down pat. Why, what makes the village of Torquay such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? Hmm. Well, well, the village of Torquay is um, one of those one of those small communities where you can come here and buy a a pretty fancy house for for next to pennies on the dollar and um who doesn't want to do that when the house prices in the big centers are millions of dollars for the same size house um 
you can come here and, and you don't have to worry about your 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 kids um everybody kind of knows everybody and um I, I see my daughter's just got home from school and she's already ran over to the neighbors and and you don't have to worry about what they're what's going to happen with them going over to the neighbors because you know the neighbor um working here um you know agriculture there's all kinds of agriculture jobs here um, springs uh, harvest fall um, we always have farmers looking for hired hands there's lots of work oil patches around here um, lots of oil jobs we have mining in Estevan um, we also have deep geothermal which is Canada's first geothermal power plant happening just south of us um, exciting exciting things lithium lithium mining is happening along with that too um, we're excited about that um, hopefully that attracts people to our community um, and and playing well America is right right across our border my closest international airport is Wilson North Dakota and I believe it's 45 minutes away get to anywhere in, in the US um, and it's you know, probably we, cheaper we to have... fly out that way too <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we, we have Rafferty Dam uh, right right close to us that has unbelievable fishing. You know, Onger Parks uh, right right next door. Um, you know, Estevan's close to uh, Boundary Dam, which has bass fishing, fishing, which is, I think, the only place in Saskatchewan that has bass fishing. So um, lots of interesting things to do here. If you like hunting, this, this is the place to be, especially bird hunting, um, you know, lots of deer lots of mule deer lots of moose moving in which is which is quite crazy to me I, I, when i grew up as a kid here we didn't have moose but now we seem to see lots of moose and uh it's exciting um probably not for those people that may have hit one when they're driving but you know just having that stuff around here um it, and you know if if you like being uh in a place with big backyards um you don't have to look out your window and see your neighbor this is the place to be your worship, I want to thank you so much for taking the last 35 minutes, almost 40 minutes of your time and sitting down and chatting about yourself and your community. It was an honor and a pleasure to have you on. Thanks, Chris. I, I really enjoyed it. And, and, and I love the format of uh, just open, honest talk. I, I think we lose that uh, quite a bit in this day, day and age when everybody's trying to uh, please somebody else for something. So open, honest talk is always great for me. So thank you. Well, we will certainly have you back on for sure that when we're talking about uh, rural of, well, when we're talking about Saskatchewan municipalities, we'll have you back on. But I want to thank you, uh, Your Worship, for having coming on and taking time out of your busy day to do this. And I want to remind our viewers and our listeners, put down Twitter, put down Instagram, put down Facebook, put down TikTok or whatever you want. Don't put down WhatsApp because that's where people get their information according to the village of Torquay. <laughs> But here we are. And go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our democracy, it helps our society, and it helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. We will be back tomorrow with Jen Schmidt Rempel, City Councilor uh, for the City of Lethbridge here in Alberta. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking. Mm -hmm.